Hey, Spring fans. Uh, today we're going to take a very quick look, and, and by the way, I should underscore that word, uh, quick, uh, at the Kotlin programming language. The whole point uh, of this installment is to is to see what it looks like to build a very simple application uh, with Kotlin and uh, and with Spring. Uh, and the short story, the, 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 the takeaway, uh, I'll go ahead and spoil it, is that there's almost nothing extra that you need to understand in, able to, in order to be able to use it with Spring, because it just works. It's a, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Kotlin is a JVM uh, based programming language. It's from it's released from the it's released by the folks uh, from JetBrains, uh, and they've uh, released this separate language naturally as a as a as a language developed by the folks at JetBrains. It has a first class integration with uh, uh, IntelliJ, but there are uh, plugins that allow you to work with it in other IDEs as well. And in fact, I I may be mistaken, but I think the JetBrains folks actually developed the Eclipse plugin, which I think is um, pretty awesome. So. Spring, uh, by, by, virtue, by virtue of the fact that it's a, a JVM citizen, uh, it works naturally with any of these um, any of these sort of languages on the JVM that, that uh, support annotations and uh, and objects, right? So uh, if you're using uh, Scala, that'll work fine. If you're using um, Ceylon, that works fine. If you're using Groovy, uh, it works fine. And if you're using Kotlin, so today we're going to just take a quick look at uh, at Kotlin. Okay, so we'll build a a beautiful Kotlin example here, and uh, I'll build a web application. I'll talk to MongoDB. Um, and uh, I think that's, you know, we're not going to spend too long today, so we'll build a simple app. But in order to get the Kotlin support, you need to switch to the full version and then go down here to the, the language section, right? And so here we can see the, the three well-supported, uh, you know, languages out of the box. We're going to choose Kotlin here. And uh, that's it. Everything else is the same. Nothing else changes down here. Right? We don't have to do anything else special. So we'll hit Generate. And we'll be given a zip file, which we can open up in our in our uh, IDE, and I, I, I'm going to use IntelliJ, but again, it works uh, just fine in other languages, other IDEs, although I don't know, uh, to be honest with you, how great the experience is. Uh, one thing is that Kotlin is uh, becoming very popular these days. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just gained um, first-class support in the, in the Gradle build tool, so you can now author Gradle build files using uh, Kotlin, and uh, Kotlin has been for a long time well-supported uh, on Android, which tends to run a generation or two uh, behind in terms of JVM interoperability. So you can write Kotlin programs that run on Java 1.7, for example, on Android. Uh, and this is very, very cool because uh, Kotlin is actually a superset of the J of the Java language syntax, right? It's not, rather, it's it's not all the same features, but if you were to sort of compare checkbox by checkbox what you get out of Kotlin versus Java, you'll find there's some more niceties in Kotlin. And, um, and, 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 and make no mistake, Java 8 is uh, certainly making progress, and Java 9 looks to be a nice step forward, and and so on, but a lot of the features that we're excited about in Java, in the roadmap for Java, like the, the possibility of having type inference for variables, that is to say, uh, val and var, that is already there in Kotlin. It's already there, and it's working, and you can use it, and it runs fine on older virtual machines. So um, there's no reason to, 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 to delay if you want to play with these features. So let's go ahead and look at our application here. We're going to open up our Kotlin application. It's a, just a .kt file, right, inside of IntelliJ. And the first thing you see is we've got a, a main method defined outside of the class, right? And that may be a little, uh, that may be a little of a, little bit of a, of a shocker for those of you who are used to Java. Uh, we have a standalone function here, right? There's no uh, requirement that things be scoped to a, to a particular class. Uh, another thing that you may notice is this open keyword. Uh, this is this is a, a requirement when you're using Spring. So when you're when you're using Spring and Kotlin, remember that almost everything you do should be open. And open in the Kotlin world means that uh, the class is not final. That is to say, uh, by default, classes and uh, and functions in Kotlin are the equivalent of Java's final keyword. They're sealed. They're they're uh, yeah, not meant to be subclassed. But you have to you have to explicitly toggle that behavior. So it's the default. Whereas in Java, everything's open. You have to use final to, to, to lock it. In Kotlin, everything is locked and you have to open it for everything for it to be uh, open. The reason you have to do this is because um, Spring, in order to do its work uh, as a dependency injection container that provides services, uh, it creates lots of proxies. And these proxies are based on, uh, you know, proxies in general are based on the idea that we dynamically subclass your types for you, right? We can't do that if your, your methods are final. So you'll have the same limitation if you were to make all of your code in Java final. You'd find a uh, you'd find trouble working with uh, Spring as well there, right? And it's not just Spring. I mean, any other framework that does any kind of reflection, uh, like Hibernate or, or, or um, indeed, almost anything, uh, will have trouble with these kinds of types. So open is the, is the default, and that's 
I think uh, the one bit of extra verbosity that you would get by when you by moving to this uh, to the Kotlin language. But it is a, a, a overall, I think, a very concise language. So let's go ahead and try it. We're going to go ahead and build a simple application. We'll have a, an entity, uh, an open entity, uh, a data entity. That it's going to be actually we're going to, we're going to create a type. We're going to create a type called a person, and uh, this person is a class, right? That we want to uh, to implement. Um, but this uh, this class is a uh, is um, just a, a pojo. It's gonna have d it's gonna have fields that we're gonna store in the database using Spring Data MongoDB. And so while I could just make it a class like this, uh, um, what I really want is I want a class that has fields, and I want getters and setters, and I want a, a, a few constructors, and I want a two string method and a copy method, and I want all that sort of stuff, right? So Kotlin has a special kind of entity, a special kind of class for that, called a data class, right? Um, and so data classes are very convenient. They expect a, a constructor. And so here, too, is another difference between what you've seen in, in, in the J, in Java versus a more modern uh, JVM languages, is that we can define the constructor in the class definition, right? The, the primary constructor. Secondary constructors take another form. Uh, but for data classes, we, this is very convenient, right? In the constructor, we can define the fields that are expected. So I'm going to say that I expect a mutable field uh, for the first name and a mutable field for the last name and a mutable field uh, for the ID. Well, in in uh, in Kotlin, it's uh, you have to go out of your way to make things mutable, right? Uh, by default, everything is immutable. So if you want to express that a value can be changed, you must use a specific type of prefix, var, Whereas a value that can't be changed, that's constant, uh, after it's been initialized, that is, is val, right? So this is a, a this is the equivalent of saying final int i equals ten, right? You can, it's it's going to always be ten. You can't change it once it's been initialized. Um, so we want this to be uh, we want this to be um, to be uh, mutable. And by the way, Kotlin data classes will create a setter for us as well. That that also changes what is generated for us automatically by the compiler. So we're going to create a var first name field, and we, we declare the type after the variable name, right? This is a pretty common convention, Pascal convention, uh, for for naming things. Uh, so we're going to say that we have a first name. Now, this name may be null, right? Var is not the same, you know, the fact that it may be changed is not the same uh, as the as the idea that it may be null. Uh, so we need to, to say that it may optionally be null. So we will uh, use this, this question mark operator to signal that, okay? Then we're going to say var last, and we'll say that's a string as well, question mark equals null. And then we're going to create an ID, so ID, and our string, you know, it's again, it's another string, um, will be null. Now, what I'm doing is I'm saying I've got three fields here, var, first, last, and ID. These are mutable, they may, cha may, be, may, be, may be changed, they're of type string, uh, and they have default values, right? So I'm, I'm assigning null to them. Uh, but you could sign them, you know, some other arbitrary string, right? It could be whatever. That would be the default value in this case. But uh, it suffices for us to just leave it as is right there, right? So, we and that's it. That's that's all we need to do for uh, for us to, you know, usefully define this class. We can uh, annotate it as we would uh, anything else. So we're going to make this a, the ID field, and we'll call this a Spring Data document, okay? Uh, and there we go. We don't have to do any code generation, no command N inside of IntelliJ to generate getters and setters and constructors and two-string methods and equals methods. All that is just done for us. Uh, and now we can get to the business of, of actually working with the database. So I'll create a uh, repository, right, as you would normally. So I'll create a, a person repository, a Spring Data person repository. And I'm going to subclass the JPA repository. In order to do that, I use the colon operator. We have a unified syntax for both subtyping and uh, implementation of interfaces. So I'll say JP repo uh, uh, Mongo repository rather. Sorry, uh, Mongo repository for entities of type person, whose primary key is of type string, and there we go. That's it, right? I'm, I don't have to even do this, uh, although I could. In fact, maybe I will. Let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about the interface definition here. So, I'm going to say fun um, all, and I will return return a stream of person, right? And uh, this is just a Java JDK 8 stream. Of course, everything you can do in the JDK works here as well. I'll use a custom query to return everything. Uh, and there we are. There's my very simple interface uh, that Spring Data will pick up for me and implement. Now, what I want to do next is I want to create some uh, sample data. right? I want to create some sample data and then use that sample data 
to, to, to you know to have something to work with. So um, we'll go ahead and implement the command line runner, right? There's my command line runner uh, contract, and you can see that I need to override this method. I've overridden the, the the run method from the command line runner, but in order to do my work, I need a um, person repository, right? So I'll say person repository, person repository. That's now a constructor argument. I've now, you know, I've now told Spring that I want that dependency uh, to be provided as a constructor argument. And of course, in um, Spring 4.3, which is what Spring Boot 1.4 is using, uh, we don't even need to provide the at auto wire annotation for that, right? So this will work, right? This is the equivalent of if, if I had created a configuration class, created a, an, an explicit constructor, and then and then left it uh, as is without, you know, with with the uh, parameter there. I don't even have to define the field, right? Spring will, sorry, Kotlin will give me that variable as a field, which I can then reference inside of my method. So this dot person dot repository, etc. All that stuff works. So let's go ahead and iterate over uh, some names, and we'll create some sample records. I'm going to say uh, uh, Phil, Web, Dave, Sire, Spencer, Gib. Right, we've got just some names here. Uh, Brian, Clozel, um, Sebastian, Deleuze, uh, Mark, Fisher. There we are. So we've got a few records, and what I want to do is, that, you know, I want to visit each record. So again, this is a good chance to to go through each name. I'm going to map it. And here you can see the map method is expecting it's the same map method as you'd expect from from Java 8, but I'm going to pass in a function and I don't need to provide the parentheses. So the the map uh, syntax, if I want to, I can just print. I can I can do something with the implicit parameter, right? This is actually a lambda that I'm going to provide. It has an impl it's got one parameter called it it. That's the default implicit parameter. I can give it a name. I can say um, Fn right for first and last, last name, and then I can uh, delimit the the parameter block from the rest of the the method lambda block uh, by using that arrow syntax. So I'm saying Fn. I'm going to now map Fn by splitting it in half. Right. Uh, the last statement, the last ex, uh, you know sort of expression in the in the block is what's is what's returned. By the way, so I don't have to explicitly return anything. Uh, so there's that, and then I want to I want to visit every single one of those records, the tuples, if you will, like this, and I want to save some data in the repository. So I'll say new person. I don't need to create new person. I just say person, and uh, then I write some records. So the uh, the first name is tuple uh, of zero. Second name is, you know, the last name, the family name is tuple of one, and um, the uh, ID is automatically provided for us, right? Spring Data will do that for us, so we don't need to implement that. That's the another thing about this, uh, these optional default parameters. It's like having a, a multiple different constructors, right? I could have a constructor that takes one field, a constructor that takes two fields, or a constructor that takes all three, uh, and that's just implied for us, right? Um, we don't. We only have one sort of constructor here. We don't have to worry about providing all these overloads and all that stuff. All that's done for us automatically by having Kotlin. So now. I can uh, visit my repository and I can say, let's find all the records, or, or even better, let's just find them all and, and consume them as a stream. And uh, I'll visit each one and I'll print out it, right? Where it, in this case, is the, uh, as I say, the uh, implied uh, parameter for the lambda. So, just in case I have any existing data in the database, I'll delete all of them. Okay, now, you may have noticed a few default types that are returned here. So, for example, void in Java. This Java void in the auto completion, uh, we're, we're 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 led to believe that it's unit, right? So that's the default. That's how uh, Kotlin talks about um, void. Um, in Kotlin, there are special collections as well. So you can say collections. You know, let me try a map here. Okay. So Kotlin dot collections. These are slightly um, more uh, convenient types that are optimized for interaction with Kotlin programs. Uh, that that build upon the the base types in the, inside of the JDK. So, uh, you know, if you can use those, great. If you can't, that's okay as well. And um, and uh, that's it. So let's go ahead and start it up. Now we we're at we're clocking in right now at forty three lines of code. And, and I, you know, obviously lines of code doesn't really tell you much in a, about a about a program's uh, merit or sophistication or anything. But uh, I want you to sort of appreciate what this would look like 
uh, in Java. And then uh, if you if you understood Kotlin syntax, so fast forward, you know, a day or two from now, and and you're just able to express yourself in Kotlin syntax, uh, would you be able to at a glance understand what's happening here? And I would argue that yes. I would argue that even if you're you're using just regular Java, and you haven't seen Kotlin before at all, you'll be able to at a pretty quick glance understand what's happening here, uh, because you've, you've got considerably less to do. You don't even have to you don't even have to scroll up and down really. I mean, if I scroll all the way down, I I still fit everything in the in the code page. So let's go ahead and run this, and we're going to use the uh, the Kotlin. We have to create a you know an IntelliJ doesn't have a, it's not quite uh, doing what I would like it to do. It's it's trying to run it as a Java application. So I'll say OK, and then I'll say that I would run this as a um, a Kotlin application, right? So create this, and you know the IntelliJ support for Spring Boot is is pretty good. One of the things that it enables by default is that uh, it'll uh, it'll make sure that if you have uh, a web application that blocks a port, for example, that'll kill the existing one and then start it again. That way you don't have this port conflict error all the time. So I'm going to say single instance only. I'm going to hit apply and uh, we'll then run this. Now, compilation is, a, is arguably a little slower in Kotlin. Um, this is true and uh, right now it seems to be taking an inordinate amount of time although it's usually very very quick uh, in fact it's really quick given all the extra syntax uh, that Kotlin supports um, but I saw an amazing blog and, I, and if I could find it I'll link it in the um, YouTube video but uh, I saw a great blog the other the other week uh, about uh, uh, Kotlin's uh, compilation speed and so on uh, as, a, as a measurement of how well it works with um, long going project. So actually you can use Kotlin and run the application there we go, so there's our records, right? There's our, there's our data, there's all the records in the, uh, in the database. Uh, I have in my application right now an embedded web server I uh, don't really need and so we'll uh, get rid of that and uh, we'll restart just to see if that makes it a little bit faster because right now it seems to be crawling. One thing that is of you know worth paying attention to here is that we've got the uh, Kotlin standard lib. That's basically the uh, the extent of what um, the Spring Boot initializer is doing for you when you use Kotlin like this. It's uh, adding the uh, Maven plugin here and adding the standard library. So I've done nothing to my environment. I've not set up any custom JDKs. I've not I've not done anything. It's just entirely a function of my Maven build, so anybody can compile this code. They don't have to set up a custom SDK or custom path or or anything, right? They just did Maven clean install, so it, it interops perfectly with the rest of the ecosystem, with the rest of the team, uh, etc. And of course, Kotlin libraries can be, uh, create, you know, packages jars which you can then reuse and so on. So let's see what's happening. There's our records. There's our data. Everything seems uh, much happier. So there we go. We have now. Um, uh, an application, it started, it, it wrote data to the database, we then uh, uh, enumerated that data, and uh, and so on. So we now have a pretty clean language, it, you know, it's a, it looks very familiar to anybody who's using Java uh, or, or, or Groovy or anything else, and uh, I hope you'll give it a shot. There's a lot of really nice things to recommend Kotlin. Uh, what I talked about here were specifically the things you might want to know about um, when using it with the Spring Boot application, but there are, as I say, uh, some very nice syntax uh, features, you know, besides type inference, which is being sort of discussed uh, for the roadmap for Java, uh, and bef besides um, uh, a really, really sophisticated type system, um, and uh, the sort of default support for mutability and so on. There's also some some other nice things, like for example, extension functions. You can actually add functions to any arbitrary type uh, after the fact, so to speak. Uh, so, for example, if you want to add a um, a uh, bootify. Uh, method, right? Uh, maybe you want to add, change the way that the JDK's string class works. You could say function string dot bootify uh, and then say return, or you don't need to return bootiful this, right? And now anywhere you had a string you could say bootify, right? That's a, that's just built in onto the um, onto the uh, default uh, 
sort of string class, right? And that'll work in all your code. So now you can have convenience methods instead of having these uh, separate companion objects. And you can do that too, by the way, right? Like you can you, you can see that uh, you can have functions that are standalone as well. So that's another nicety is that you can you know you can model things that are purely sort of functional uh, bits and, and, and share them much more naturally instead of shoehorning them into this uh, to a, um, an approach that may not work for you. All right, with that, uh, we'll wrap this up, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks so much.